Greetings. I'm Michelle English, and on behalf of the Center for International Studies and MIT Mexico, welcome you to today's STAR Forum. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that we have many more events planned for the semester, including one this Friday at noon on the philosophy of human rights. <coughs> Details for this event and others are available in the foyer. And for those who haven't already, we also have a sign-up list so you can receive email notices on all of our events. In typical format, today's event will conclude with, question, with a question and answer session. For the Q&A, I'd like to ask everyone to please be mindful of time and to ask only one question. And we will be using the microphones during Q&A. Um, and please um, identify yourself and your affiliation prior to asking your question. It's truly an honor to have with us today Luis Videgare to discuss the challenge of AI policy around the world. Dr. Videgare is director of the MIT AI Policy for the World Project and a senior lecturer at the Sloan School of Management. It is also an honor to have with us Kenneth Oy. He's joining the conversation. Professor Oy is both a professor of political science in the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences and of Data Systems and Society in the School of Engineering. He is also director of the Program on Emerging Technologies at the Center for International Studies. At this time, I'd like to invite Professor Oy to the podium to provide introductory comments and to formally introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Videgare. So thank you, Michelle. Uh, it is truly a pleasure to be offering an introduction for Luis. By way of background, the gentleman that you see sitting here in the front row has a long and distinguished and sometimes sordid history. The distinguished part is an undergraduate degree from ITAM. The sordid part is a doctorate from MIT. Uh, and Luis also served as foreign minister and finance minister of, of Mexico. I have to tell you a little story by way of introduction. Uh, Luis spoke to a group of 85 senior American officials. And after his presentation, a three-star general came over. And he said, Professor, is Luis available to become Secretary of State? <laughs> and I indicated that that might be difficult to arrange. But his duties have included working on the successor to the NAFTA, the USMCA, on a range of issues, putting out financial crises and handling problems and disputes on everything from immigration uh, to conventional investment and trade policy. Luis will be speaking today on AI and development. And this topic takes something that is near and dear to the hearts of all of us at MIT, AI, but to have a serious discussion of the implications and effects of the technologies being developed here and elsewhere uh, for development prospects around the world. The format will be a presentation by Luis. We'll have a little bit of a conversation up front, and then we'll turn to you for questions and answers. And as uh, Michelle indicated, please identify yourself, and we'll have a microphone for you to speak. Luis, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Ken. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, I'm very proud to be here, very thankful to the Center of International Studies and to Ken in particular for inviting me to be at the START Forum uh, today. Thank you for all of you for being here. Um, I, see, uh, I, I see many friendly faces. Um, thank you for the students from Sloan that are here. Um, uh, and uh, I, I want to single out somebody who's here that to me is very special. Um, 35 years ago, uh, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, mention two people, because I just saw one uh, uh, that he just came in. But I, I want to start with my thesis advisor. Uh, it was, Jim, that was, my thesis was completed 22 years ago. Um, uh, and uh, I had the privilege uh, to go through MIT as a student with the guidance of Jim Poterba, one of the best uh, teachers, not only of economics, but about a lot of things in life. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real honor for you to be here, James. Thank you so much. And I also, <laughs> and by the way, that your new office is 
looks a lot, a lot better than the old one because the, the building is new. So, so it's, uh, it's, 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 it's great. I also want to mention and acknowledge the presence here of the Consul General of Mexico. Um, thank you, uh, Consul General, for being here, Alberto, my friend. Um, that's, it, it's an honor to have the highest representative of the Mexican government here uh, with us today. So um, Kim was very... <laughs> Kim was very nice um, um, uh, in his presentation. Um, and believe me, I, I have a lot of, let's call them war stories about my career in government, about the US-Mexico relationship and many other things. We're not gonna talk about that today. Um, uh, of course, uh, we can always do that. Uh, uh, please feel free to approach me and, and we can always talk about um, any of those issues. But we're gonna talk about artificial intelligence today. And in particular, uh, we're gonna talk about artificial intelligence policy. And what is, how is that evolving around the world? Why is that important? And where are we, are we going? Or are we getting somewhere with that? So let's get, let's get started. And uh, uh, this, shouldn't be, this shouldn't be long. So what do we mean when we say artificial intelligence policy? That's the first question, because there's a lot of concerns about AI. And uh, uh, so, so uh, I'll try to provide here not a definition, but actually a collection of themes that would constitute a coherent or a comprehensive AI policy. And as you'll see, we'll start with a blank page, and it will quickly, quickly fill up with lots of themes and lots of complex issues. First of all, one key topic of AI policy is the use of AI in the delivery of government services and goods. And this is uh, this is something that, that is uh, uh, gaining a lot of traction around the world, perhaps a little bit of less visibility, but it's extremely important. In a lot of places, healthcare, education, are core activities, core services provided by the government. In many other countries, like my own, um, the government conducts anti-poverty programs. Um, but also serv core services like, say, tax collection are can be aided with the, and can be delivered with the support of AI. So the use of AI to have a better government um, is an important first thing. By the way, this is how I got involved with machine learning um, uh, many years ago. I was, well, five, five years ago, I was uh, <coughs> finance minister of Mexico. Uh, and, as, and as such, I oversaw the governance of the, our tax collection authority. And we were trying to do things a little bit better and, and after several frustration, frustrating conversations with consultants, I ended up talking to computer scientists and, this, and realized that this new, well, not, not so new methodology called machine learning could actually help in doing things a little bit better. Um, uh, uh, it's a complex implementation, but there's a, a lot of potential in having better delivery of services uh, in, in doing that. By the way, a lot of, uh, there, there's interesting research here at MIT um, particularly the media lab on how to do um, better delivery of anti-poverty uh, programs with the aid of AI, how to make them more effective, how to make them more efficient. Second, a key question about AI policy is how should governments invest uh, or use public resources in AI? Is this something that should be completely left out for the market or should governments step in and support both the development and the rollout, the, the use of AI in society. Of course, basic question is research and development. And this is a, a question that looks a little bit different uh, in a country like the US or in a developing country. Uh, you, uh, there's, but it goes beyond that. Uh, you have the question of, should the government be supporting investment vehicles for startups, uh, venture capital funds with public uh, 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 resources. Uh, this is a model that is uh, very much used in Asia, uh, particularly China. You see a lot of venture capital coming from the government into, into industry. So that's, that's an interesting question. Um, education. Should the government be doing more in funding education and computing? Or what about tax breaks and other incentives for the use of AI in the economy? I'm talking about the economy. Third big question, third big uh, theme is AI in the economy. 
And a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the conversation about AI is about jobs displacement and the inequality that it can create. And it's a very valid topic of discussion. Um, here, MIT has a very strong task force, which is uh, uh, the future, uh, uh, the, the work of the future task force that is preparing a report. There's already a partial delivery of that. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it in a second, uh, about how AI uh, interacts with the job market. Does it, does it create new jobs? Uh, is it, uh, will it displace human beings? Uh, those, those questions are central to any AI policy. But, it's, but economic questions go beyond that. It's also market power. It's also, con uh, that means concentration, antitrust policy. Today we are seeing news from Europe on data, on data policy. Uh, uh, just a few hours ago, the European Union issued a, a new communication on how they're gonna uh, uh, deal with um, uh, internet platforms. And um, even things like algorithmic collusion in financial markets which is a new topic, but some things that there, there's already some indication that these things might happen. So a whole block of issues on the economy. Then we have the, socially, uh, the, the, the social responsibility issues of, a, of, of AI. Things like privacy, the fact that um, the type of AI that has exploded is a, uh, of the statistical type, it's um, a machine learning and in particular deep learning, uh, it consumes lots and lots of information uh, and so how do you deal with that model of learning with uh, the right to privacy and to a private life? So that's a, that's a big discussion. Also the issue of fairness and bias and, and the possibility of discrimination. Uh, we know that algorithm, uh, algorithms can be biased uh, for several reasons. Um, explainability. Uh, uh, some, some type of algorithms, but in particularly um, uh, deep learning algorithms are hard to uh, are hard to interpret, hard to, hard to understand how they get to the uh, predictions that they get to. Uh, and this can be quite frustrating and quite important in some settings. Um, think of a judge that is basing a decision on a recommendation by an algorithm. If the judge cannot understand why is that recommendation being done, that's a problem. But it, you can think of that also in the medical context. Uh, you can think of that in the job market. Robustness, that is the, the, the consistency and, and how, to, uh, how resistant the, the algorithms are to either random variations in the world, but also adversarial intentional attacks on their predictions, uh, the question of accountability. Then we have a fifth block, which is AI and democracy. And the use of these sophisticated techniques of learning, very granular information to manipulate the minds of consumers, but also of voters and to influence politics um, in democracies, influence the opinion polls, influence, of course, elections. Uh, we have the questions of surveillance, how um, uh, machine learning can power new tools of surveillance, starting with face recognition, but goes well beyond face recognition and the emergence of a surveillance. Some people talk about surveillance capitalism, some people talk about a surveillance state, uh, but this is clearly an issue, and of course, AI enabling authoritarian regimes, uh, uh, techno authoritarianism that we see in some places, some very important places around the world. And finally, the geopolitics of AI. This is a reality. This is a little bit of the, of the elephant in the room. Not everybody likes to talk about the geopolitical dimension to the, of technology, but there's clear, there, there are clearly rival models around the world. Uh, we see a model uh, of te technology deployment in China. We see a different model in Europe, and we see an emerging model uh, in the US. According to culture, history, these are different models, and countries around the world realize that. There's a lot of talk about a technological decoupling happening as we speak. Just go to the general press and you'll see uh, uh, almost every day you, hear, you, you, you can read about a coming AI Cold War or a, or, or, or a, uh, a lot of concerns on national security uh, and, uh, uh, and, and this division of the world into separate camps. By the way, for a country that is neither China nor the US nor part of the European Union, this is a problem because it means where do we stand? Think, think, think for a moment of a Latin American country or an African country or a country in Southeast Asia. Is this about choosing sides? So you have these six blocks of themes. We could have a lecture on each block 
we could have a lecture on each line within the blocks. So this is a very complex problem. And this is not something that will be solved um, in, a, in a single report. This, is, this has got to be a collective conversation, and it's going to take a while. Uh, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be uh, years in the, in the making. There's a seventh topic that I've added in the middle, which is sustainability. And we should keep in mind that machine learning is a computationally intensive um, technology. It needs a lot of electricity. That means that there's a relevant and increasingly relevant carbon footprint about uh, machine learning. So we need to keep that in mind. I would add that as a seventh, as a seventh topic. Okay. So how are we doing in terms of developing a consistent, effective AI policy around the world? As you may imagine, this is a process that is just starting. And the first fact that I want to point out, and these are all stylized facts, is that the world of policymakers, on one hand, and the world of computer scientists are very different and are far, far away. This means, first of all, that there's an information lag. So things that concern computer scientists today might become concerns of policymakers uh, still uh, a few years into the future. Think about the question of privacy. Privacy has been an issue, a very important issue for computer scientists for a long, long time. And uh, it's been a policy issue much more recently. And, and you can also, almost on every topic, see there's a lag. But it's not just the lag. There, there, the, uh, these are technologies that are quite complex. You need, to, uh, uh, if you really want to understand deep learning, you have to understand a lot of math. Yeah, computer scientists will tell you it's not that complicated. Well, if you're if you're not a computer scientist or or, or, or as an MIT scientist, it's it's hard. Um, so there's need there needs to be some translation, and who does that translation is also inter introducing noise. Who does the translation? Well, you have the general press. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not that good. By the way, I strongly recommend um, uh, MIT News. They do a lot of coverage of what happens uh, here at MIT, and also MIT's technology review, that they do a very good and balanced coverage of what's happening around the, in, in, in the world of, of machine learning. Um, a lot of work, uh, multilaterals. Uh, the World Bank, you'd be amazed how many countries approach the World Bank or the OECD, even non-members approach these organizations seeking uh, advice, looking for advice. We at MIT know that because then the World Bank or the, uh, uh, or the OECD come to MIT to ask questions, not to me, but to people who really know about this stuff. They, uh, and and uh, these, are, these are good translations. Then we have the think tanks. Some think tanks are good, some are very partisan, uh, so there's a little bit of a mix. Then we have consultants. And consultants are jumping into this opportunity because there's a need for knowledge and consultants are everywhere. And they're making some very strong claims and I'll show you one in a minute. And then of course, one of the biggest sources of this translation of knowledge are the tech companies, which is good because the tech companies are very strong in their knowledge, but the problem is that they are not unbiased. They have an interest, they might have a conflict of interest in trying to influence through, the, uh, through knowledge spreading, uh, actual policies. And finally, there's a language ga uh, gap. There's a, lot, there's a lot of hype, a lot of buzzwords, uh, a lot of things that um, people write in, their, uh, in, in, in the correct context, in the original uh, papers or essays, and make sense. But taking out of context just don't make a lot of sense. And you start, uh, you start reading everywhere about um, um, uh, eco, eco for, uh, ecosystems of innovation, leapfrogging opportunities. That's a favorite of Ken and I. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, you, you see a lot of technical term, terms used incorrectly. There's, there's a, a tendency to very rapidly adopt these, these possible. So I'll give you uh, just a couple of examples. I don't know if you're familiar with this book. This is a book of two authors from MIT, from the Sloan School, um, uh, Eric and Andrew. And it's a very good book. It's a book written back in 2014, The Second Machine Age. And uh, it's, it's, it's a brilliant book. Uh, it's actually today, six years after it, uh, being published, a very good read uh, still. And if you can see by the title, they were announcing a second machine age. 
Does anybody today talk about a second machine age? Not really, not in the policy world. What people talk about is the fourth industrial revolution. This is, by the way, I, I, I know Klaus Schwab very well. We're, 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 we're friends. Uh, this is not a bad book. But quite frankly, this is a much better book. But the platform in which it was, in which it was um, not only published but, but publicized was much more powerful. Uh, of course, the, the, the World Economic Forum has a, is, is a loud uh, voice around the world with a lot of convening power. So nobody talks today about the second machine age. A lot of people talk about the fourth industrial revolution. Just ask a question, what were the previous three? Nobody knows. Uh, but people talk about the fourth industrial revolution. I'll give you another example. MIT, as I mentioned, um, is working on the Work of the Future uh, Task Force. In the fall, in October, they release this report. And it's a very good report. If you have a chance to read it, I strongly recommend it. It's not final, still a lot of work uh, pending. But here, for example, if you're interested in what's going to happen to truck drivers uh, with, the, with auto autonomous vehicles, particularly long haul trucking, uh, what's going to happen? Here you'll find a very balanced, balanced uh, approach. And, and, and clearly, the evidence is nowhere near uh, claiming that all jobs in truck driving, in long distance uh, uh, driving, are going to be lost. That, 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 is, that is not the case. At the same time, literally, the same month that that report was published, um, PBS uh, released this uh, documentary on AI. And it has an entire 40 minute section full of uh, uh, anxiety, essentially announcing that truck driving uh, is, is going to end in, 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 in a very short period of time. And that is not science-based. It's a lot of hype. Just ask me which of these two materials has been more influential, has been more watched or read. Obviously, it's a documentary on your, on your right. And then let me just skip to another favorite. And uh, this is, I'm not going to name the consultant the, 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 this, is, this is from a very large uh, consulting firm. Uh, those, these two blocks, I've added them on purpose to hide the name of that consulting firm because I'm not going to say something nice about them. Uh, but they are making these kind of claims. To me, this is, this is a phenomenal claim. So these consultants, they have a toolkit, a responsible AI toolkit that enables organizations, that means governments, that means companies, enables organizations to build high quality, transparent, explainable, and ethical AI applications that generate trust and inspire confidence. OK, we're done. We just need to go to that. <laughs> Quite frankly, it's not that easy. And just uh, 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 spend, spend a morning around C-Sale or go to the Media Lab, and you'll see that these are extremely difficult issues to deal with. This is not, this is not as simple. So um, let's, let's, let's think, what can a policy maker learn already? And I want to, to share with you three things that today a policymaker can actually learn about the state of AI policy or the, or the framework towards AI policy um, around the, the world. First of all, it's well established that there's a need for a policy guardrail. You if you go back to the 90s and the emergence of the internet, and we all, uh, some of you might be familiar with Section 230, and it was, it was thought perhaps uh, back uh, uh, looking, looking backwards, we can now claim that a little bit uh, naive. Uh, it was thought that just the ability to, to share more information and to consume more information was going to be good for, the, for, for everybody. Well, it turns out that it was very good, but also it had problems. It was not, it was not all good. There was, uh, and we see those problems very, very clear. We see it in politics. We see it in, uh, we, we see it in market concentration. We, uh, there, there, there are many problems with that. So. Ranging from the CEO of Alphabet, uh, the parent company of Google, to the president of MIT, to the European Commission, to the White House, everybody agrees that some policy guardrails should be there to ensure uh, socially responsible AI. Number two, and this is something that I think is consensus, this, is not so, this will not be just solved by, uh, by, by the guys that know computing and by uh, the, the, the scientists in the field. This has got to be a very interdisciplinary conversation where, uh, and a very inclusive conversation. When you hear uh, uh, you, uh, where, where the voice and the thoughts uh, of people from different backgrounds, um, not just from different disciplines, but also different cultures um, uh, come together 
and define a policy. This is not something that will just, uh, you, can, you cannot just go to, uh, 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 to a computer lab and say, okay, get me some AI policy. This has got to be, this has got to be a collective conversation. And then number three, and this is important because there, there's already, in the last three years, a good number of AI principles uh, uh, or declarations on principles for AI have been published. It depends on who you consult, but uh, clearly uh, there are at least 80 in our count. Uh, um, in, in the project that I lead, we have identified more than 80. Um, and there's already a literature on the documents on principles. So you can, f you can read papers, criticizing, comparing, uh, synthesizing. The one I recommend the most is, uh, comes from the Bergman uh, Klein Center at, at Harvard Law. Uh, they just published last month a very good, a comprehensive review of these principles. And all these not all these documents are the same, but clearly a consensus is emerging. So I think that right now we can, uh, work, still working on principles has very, very small marginal returns. We need to go to the next phase. So the key question is what comes next after the principles? Uh, I don't, I'm not saying the principles are not important. I'm saying that we've got that, uh, uh, we've got a lot of progress there. We need to make this the next step. What is the problem with principles? Well, principles are not enough. Uh, using economist uh, parlance, uh, principles are a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition for, for policy. Why is that? Because policy is about making hard choices, by the way, in uncertain conditions. And some of these principles are, can create a, a, a tension between them. So you want AI to be very, you want your algorithms to be very accurate so that when an AI, a, a machine learning algorithm is predicting cancer in, in an x-ray, you want it to be very accurate, but you also want it to be explainable and you want it to be um, fair without bias. You want the information to be, you want the information to, to be secured so there is no risk to privacy. You want the jobs of the, um, you, want, you want the jobs of the radiologists safe so there are no radiologists that are going, going away. There are many objectives that might be conflicting with each other. This is all about the trade-offs. And policy maker, policy making, I'm not, I'm not a scientist, so I, I, I talk to scientists now, but I come from the world of policy making and I can tell you, policy making in, at its core is about understanding the trade-offs and making tough decisions. Uh, so what's next after establishing the principles? To me, the key question is about the trade-offs. What are the trade-offs uh, involved? So let me, before going into, into some of the trade-offs and, and explain what I'm talking about, let me just say it's, uh, I, I, it's, it's completely unfair and absolutely inaccurate to say that computer scientists don't care about the societal effects, about the ethics of AI or the economic impact of AI. That's completely wrong. In fact, computer scientists have been working for years on these issues and have developed some quite sophisticated tools about them. A few examples, for instance, on privacy, you have uh, uh, just a couple of examples. Differential privacy has been there for, for years. It's a notion that's been there uh, in computer science. You have uh, edge computing and distributed learning, including federated learning or split learning. There are many other types of ways in, in handling the data in the algorithm training process uh, to protect privacy. On bias, there's a whole literature on constrained optimization, imposing uh, requirements like uh, um, the quality of false negatives uh, or things that would prevent certain groups from being discriminated against. Uh, or uh, there's, a, there's a whole literature on the, the, the diversity of the training data. So there's, uh, the, 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 and on explainability, uh, there's a whole set of techniques for post hoc explanations things that, analysis that are done after the training of an algorithm, and there's also uh, me methodologies for making the algorithms more, 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 um, more interpretable, more, more explainable, like transparent design. Uh, and these are just examples, and we can go on like this for robustness and for accountability. There is, there's, uh, I'm, I'm being very unfair by just putting in the slide what is really a literature of, of um, um, uh, many, many people working for years on these. So I'm going to show you what these tools look like. So if you go to 
if, you, if, you, if today you go uh, and talk to uh, people who really know artificial, artificial intelligence and say, I wanna, I wanna, I, I'm concerned about privacy or I'm concerned about fairness and bias, uh, what can you, how can you help me? They won't give you out of a box and say, okay, here's an algorithm that is unbiased or here's an algorithm that protects privacy. What it will give you is something that looks like this. What are these? These are Pareto frontiers. These are combinations that are efficient. For instance, this one is from a thesis from one of the uh, recently graduated PhD student from Media Lab, probably Mexican, Alejandro Campero. And this shows a trade-off between the utility or the accuracy of AI, of a, of a machine learning algorithm, and uh, the, the degree of privacy protection. So there's a trade-off. If you want more power, more, more utility in terms of accuracy, you lose privacy and vice versa. This one comes from a, a, a book, a, a, by the way, a book I, I, I really recommend. It's called The Ethical Algorithm from Broth and Currents to uh, researchers from uh, UPenn, uh, just published last year. And here they show a Pareto frontier between the unfairness of the algorithm and the accuracy of the algorithm. Uh, as expressed by its error. So you see here that making the algorithm more fair results in losing accuracy. For some applications, losing accuracy is not that, 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 that much of a problem, but for some applications, it's life or death, or it's, 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 it's really uh, 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 an important decision that hinges on this. So these are, not, these are not perhaps the things that people expect from the tools. Let me just give you an interpretation of, of these. What I'm, see, I'm saying here is that technical tools won't give you a straight answer, but will give you a menu of options. A menu of options that are, are efficient. Clearly, let me just go back to here. You don't, wanna, you don't wanna position yourself with a policy that gives you here, that you are under the frontier. So, so the menu, it will give you a menu, uh, it will give you a menu of, of options, but will not, do not offer policy decisions by themselves. In other words, uh, these techniques answer a question with a better question. And for AI policy is how we answer that question that we get back. So we, we say, give me an algorithm that is fair, give me an algorithm that is explainable, you'll get a sense of a trade-off. And the key question to me on defining AI policy is how do you set up uh, a framework that will allow you to give a, a good question. First of all, and this comes back from uh, a little bit of what I learned from Jim um, while studying economics, uh, you need to understand the nature of a trade-off. And I'm using here two concepts uh, transplanted from microeconomics. One is the elasticity of a trade-off. If, what do I mean? If you have a curve that is very vertical, vertical, uh, a frontier, then, you know, you can gain a lot of protection of safe uh, privacy or gain a lot in, 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 in fairness without losing much in accuracy of your algorithm. If the curve is flatter, it means that the trade-off is real. So a theoretical trade-off is not enough to present a problem. The actual problems come from the slope of the curve. So a policymaker that gets these kind of answers, the first question that I should ask is, what's the slope? That's kind of a boring question, it's an odd question. But it's an important question. What's the slope of a trade-off? If you really want to make, uh, uh, to understand your options. And the other one is the curvature. Uh, uh, is, it, is it a convex frontier where you see diminishing returns? Uh, if you see that, you're clearly, the, the, the trade-off points towards an optimal that is not gonna be a corner solution where you're gonna have to balance. So if you have a curve that, is, uh, that is, has a slope and it's curved, you're gonna be most likely uh, uh, needing a compromise. You're gonna need to, to, to it's, it's not gonna be very effective to be at the extremes. More important than that, and this is the key concept that if I, if I wanted you to uh, take away something out of this uh, 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 conversation, I would, I would mention uh, this one. The key challenge is actually not pinpointing to the, tra to the curves, is to create an institutional design that would allow for democratic decision-making about the trade-offs. Because, and why, why do I underscore the word democratic? Because technology is not just about technology and technologists. 
it's, it affects us all. And we want to have a setup where we decide what is more important uh, based on the opinion of, 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 of uh, 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 society as a whole, not just either the technocrats or uh, the, the, the scientists. Uh, there needs to be a process of institutional design to get there. Um, mm, one more slide on the trade-offs. The trade-offs are not just about accuracy, but about other things. What about innovation? What about international leadership? A lot of people are concerned that imposing restrictions on machine learning on things like privacy, fairness, explainability would slow down innovation. And if you slow down innovation, you might lose leadership in the international arena. Actually, you read that a lot. If you go to the general press, you read that a lot. And if you go to Washington, I've done that, uh, uh, to Capitol Hill and to the White House, you'll hear this a lot. And this is a very understudied question. I haven't seen any paper showing uh, what is the empirical relationship between these? What is the theoretical relationship about these? This is all based on this is this is this is all based on assumptions and quite frankly sometimes in emotions. So let me let me just uh, uh, five final thoughts on regulation. Let me I'm, and I'm go, I'm going to try to land these into more specific um, uh, uh, thoughts on, on regulation. First of all, regulation is better to build it from existing frameworks than from scratch. Uh, Let's, it's important to assess existing frameworks for, say, consumer protection and build from there rather than, rather than trying to have a new law, a new completely, new complete legal instrument about algorithms. Uh, second, most regulation makes more sense if it's sector specific. So having just an AI act is probably going to be um, not very useful. Uh, you need to work through the sectors, so it's, it's, it's better to look at healthcare, it's better to look at consumer finance, it's better to, to, uh, uh, to look at mobility and transportation. Uh, but some common rules, of course, might be beneficial. It's very important to acknowledge that there are many questions that we don't know the answer for. So this might not be the best time to be making hardcore commitments to certain types of regulation. The use of temporal um, uh, frameworks, like sunset clauses, sandboxes for regulatory um, uh, experimentation, preemption periods instead of just outright bans of technology. This is relevant, for instance, for face recognition. These make, these make sense. Actually, some states in the US are being criticized for punting that, or kicking the can. That might not be such a bad idea today. The state of New York is doing that. The state of Vermont has actually a pretty good framework for um, uh, studying the issues better before imposing regulation. That is not, a, that is not necessarily a bad idea. Um, um, Pre-market testing makes sense. We do that for drugs, clinical trials. We do that for cars. Why shouldn't we be pre-market testing algorithms in realms where it, uh, it's used uh, for meaningful decisions, decisions that have life uh, critical or legal or public resources are involved. Important decisions, why don't we uh, establish market, uh, pre-market testing just as we do clinical trials for drugs? Um, this is a bit of a critique. I'm going uh, to speak uh, a critique on the European model of excessive reliance on individual rights. I think that it's not only about individual rights, but it's also about empowering the individual through technology and establishing restrictions on the, on, on the, uh, on the behavior uh, of, of corporations. Accountability is not just a challenge, but it's actually a policy tool. And well-defined accountability helps a lot towards addressing many of these uh, challenges. So defining accountability is actually a cross-sectional is a, is a cross uh, uh, activity. And then the last two slides. Beware of regulatory fragmentation. What this means. I, if, you, if you look at Europe, it might be controversial, but I think it's, they are doing something which is remarkable, which is they're going through a very cohesive, consistent process of establishing regulation. First on privacy, and now they're moving into actual algorithm uh, decision making, algorithmic decision making. They just made announcements today about that. Um, if you look at China, China has a single policy, very clear national policy. Uh, the, 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 the priorities might not be the same as in Europe or the US, but they do have a consistent policy. What about the US? The US does not have a well-established 
certainly not legislation. There are some drafts in Congress in Capitol Hill, but uh, it's the states that are making steps towards establishing regulation. So regulation in the US can emerge to be quite fragmented. So California is running away with regulation, and other states are moving in different directions. How do the states will look like? Like that. So is this a problem for Facebook? Is this a problem for Google? I don't think so. They lawyer up. They have enough resources to navigate through this complexity. But what about startups? What about um, uh, students from MIT or from Cornell or, uh, uh, or Stanford that are trying to start something and will have to go through at, at, at the extreme 50 types of legislation to deal with privacy and fairness and explainability? This is not the right approach, and I'm concerned that the US is moving in this direction. And my final slide. I think, I think we are having a huge problem with trust. And trust is probably the most important problem we have to defining AI policy. And I'm going to show you two dimensions of lack of trust. One here on the, on the vertical axis is trust of technology companies. I think that's pretty low today. I, I, and it wasn't like that just a few years ago. Google was an admired company. Uh, people wanted to work at Facebook. Amazon was cool. Today, they are companies that are uh, very feared. And certainly, there's not a lot of trust uh, uh, towards them. On this other axis, the horizontal axis, I have geopolitical trust. Trust between whom? Between leading countries. How's the relationship, how's the trust between the, the two leading countries that are the US and China? It's pretty low. So if this prevails, we'll end up defining policy in this place. We can call it the corner of fear. This is where emotions of lack of trust and fear. So we'll, so we'll, we'll have policies that are dominated by imposing restrictions on the use of technology, restricting the companies, but also restricting the flow of knowledge to cooperation between nations. And you see that a lot already. And if you ask me, this is where we are converging very, very rapidly. I'm not saying that we should be here. This is probably very naive. There are reasons to have trust issues both in this axis and this axis. Companies have, have tech companies have, 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 have given us many reasons not to trust them completely, and certainly uh, uh, the geopolitical dimension is also true. But we probably should be somewhere around here. Right now, we are here. To me, the key challenge on AI policy is how we build, how we build the frameworks, how do we build institutions and collective decision-making mechanisms to move us from here to here. Thank you very much. So can people in the back see us while seated? OK, good. Um, so what I'd like to do, Luis, is just chat a little bit for five minutes, and then turn to this voracious audience who have questions uh, I'm sure that they wish to pose. It's also, frankly, the most diverse audience I've seen at MIT with a mixture of CSAIL geeks, Center for International Studies, policy wonks, and more than one or two nerds. Uh, so this is going to be a great group. So Luis. And Sloan students. <laughs> and Sloan School students Sloan as well. Schools, yeah, those are the ones that are better dressed. <laughs> <laughs> so Luis, I want to push you a little bit on specifics. Mm -hmm. You said on the one hand <clears throat> that we need to avoid fragmentation. But you also took note of the need for sector-specific approaches, noting that the problems will be somewhat varied if you go from medical to consumer protection for consumer goods to finance. Mm -hmm. And let me ask if there is a tension between those two in that the sector specificity may require regulations that are quite different when you move from one area to another. Fragmentation, which you would define largely with reference to geography, yep. but it could also be fragmentation with reference to a degree of incoherence across sectors. So the question that I'd like to pose is on both, actually. Mm -hmm. In terms of sector specificity, could you give us the sector that you think poses the most difficult problems 
in terms of the trade-offs across utilization of the data and the methods and protection of privacy and equity. And the second question I'll have is really on fragmentation and its effects. But first on sector specificity. What sector do you think poses the most acute, difficult trade-offs? I'm going to limit my answer to the US. OK. Uh, because this question, if you present it internationally, it's, it's a broader question. But in, in the US, some of the key sectors that are um, uh, uh, in play for AI influence very rapidly, healthcare, finance, already have federal um, uh, regulation. Consumer protection is federal. So this is certainly something that is doable. By the way, it's interesting to take note on how federal legislation on finance emerged. It wasn't originally that, that by design. In its federalist, federalist nature, the US in the 19th century and early 20th century had a very fragmented financial regulation. That didn't go very well. So the US didn't have a central bank. And eventually, the Federal Reserve emerged. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the first part of the 20th century, the, the Federal Congress, at some point, um, preempted states from doing more financial regulation. And, uh, and eventually, the, the, the regulation that we have in finance is federal. So um, I think that the platforms, and, and you have that for consumer protection more broadly. And, and, uh, uh, and, and also, uh, if you think about the FDA, the F is for federal. So you already have even institutions. And you think about antitrust policy, and you have the FTC, the F is for federal. So I think that, um, um, and this might be a little bit uh, uh, in the opposite way as your question, going sectoral favors having national wide uh, uh, approaches because the institutions are already there. What I'm more concerned is with states coming up with generic AI types of regulation. And we're seeing that in privacy. California already has its own CCPA, which is inspired but not the same as the GDPR of Europe. Um, and that's, that cu cuts across every sector. And we are seeing uh, draft legislation on algorithmic decision making or the use of algorithms to, to, to make uh, decisions uh, or predictions in the, in the whole of the economy. That's the kind of fragmentation that can be a layer that comes from, from, from below and can be very, very problematic and very hard for, for, for uh, smaller companies and innovators to navigate through. So I appreciate the point on small companies having difficulty having the staff to understand 50 regulations that might bear on privacy and consent and data utilization. Understood. But one of the defenses of a federal approach, of a fragmented and federal approach, is that in an area characterized by significant uncertainty, complexity, and controversy, there can be benefits having experimentation, having different models being pursued in different areas to learn and see which works best or worst. You and don't believe. And I, I think that that has been historically the case, and you see that in transportation. The regulation of cars. Um, safety standards for cars, during many, many years it was local, it was not, it was not federal. Um, and to this date, some of the regulation, uh, including speed limits, are obviously local. So there's, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's a learning process. I'm a little bit concerned about two things. First, the U.S. is not operating in isolation. A lot of things are happening in the world. And you see Europe um, uh, pushing towards regulation that has very extraterritorial consequences and very influential. And then you have China that is moving ahead with a different framework. So yeah, I understand the value of experimentation and learning by diversity. But I'm not sure that at this particular historical moment, um, uh, uh, the US has the luxury of time to experiment in that, in that, in, in, in that way. I'm, I think that, that fragmentation can be costly in that, um, in that sense. So within a US context, you could have a federal government that would be preempting local experimentation or state experimentation internationally that becomes much more problematic. To what extent do you believe that experimentation, national differences, which some would argue reflect legitimate differences in culture, in values, Absolutely. the trade-offs that you're talking about. Different countries may value privacy versus utility in different ways. To what extent are we likely to be facing a world of increasing diversity in terms of the policies governing AI? And if so, what are the implications of that diversity? 
I think that, that, that diversity is inevitable and, and to, some, to, to some degree very much desirable. Yeah. Um, and it reflects uh, values and culture and history, and, and uh, that, is, that, that is important. But what we should be more concerned about is uh, incompatibility and adversarial models. I think that's the, that's the big question internationally. So, so um, uh, I was talking the other day with Yasheng Wang, who happens to be my neighbor, my office neighbor uh, at Sloan. And he was telling me the concept of privacy didn't exist in China as such. And the word privacy didn't exist in China 20 years ago. This is something that was brought in by this debate that we are seeing worldwide and the, use of, and, the, and the emergence of this technology. So yeah, it's natural that beyond the political differences and, and which are uh, uh, a conversation on its own, um, yeah, culture uh, will, play, will play a role. But I think what is more concerning is to have frameworks that are clearly incompatible, uh, where, and, and where you have conflicting values in, in countries that either separate and we become a, a world of technological silos or a world of uh, technological conflict. I think that, I think that, that here's, here there's a lot of room for diplomacy in this, in this context. And I'm very happy that we're doing this as part of the CIS because of that. There's a, there's a, I, I think that, that um, uh, regulation, uh, again, with a sectoral approach, is something that should be part of a conversation in either the global platforms like the UN or in bilateral negotiations like the US-China um, uh, talks, or even in like-minded frameworks like the OECD should, um, um, is. So I'll ask a couple more questions, noting that we'll be turning to the floor in just a couple minutes, OK? But we, looking very broadly at development, north-south, poor countries, rich countries, and a technology which is diffusing very rapidly with significant effects on the organization of economic activity and political activity and medical activity. To what extent, and this is a, an unfairly broad question, I want to preface it as such, but to what extent do you think AI will have the effect of providing for opportunities for equalization, limiting inequalities, more rapid diffusion of useful information, or to what extent are we really talking about technologies which will be owned and captured and controlled by the relatively wealthy and the largest countries and companies contributing to further concentration of economic and political power? Net effects, or is this too broad a question to be worthy of answering? Mm -hmm. No, it's, a, it's, it, it's, a, it's definitely a, an extremely broad question, but it's not an unfair question. And I, I, I can see both effects playing out and, and uh, uh, policy and countries individually and collectively through diplomatic means should be focusing on both possibilities. I see tremendous opportunities for equalization on, on, on services and the delivery of public goods. Um, the, the question of AI in healthcare is very different in Boston, Massachusetts than in Bolivia or in Ghana, where there is, here it's a question of quality, maybe costs, who pays for it, uh, how to ensure that it's, 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 it's good diagnostics. In other countries, it's a question of access. It's not whether this is better than the existing doctor. There are no doctors. There are no specialists in many places around the world. So technology can, can bring uh, uh, healthcare to places where it is not. Also, this happens in education. It can, happen in, it can have a profound effect in agriculture, uh, productivity, in energy efficiency. So, so there's the, the, let's not forget that AI is, uh, uh, or the type of AI that is blooming right now has a lot of potential for good things. And those things should be uh, encouraged and enabled. But also, we are seeing it already, as in previous waves of technological innovation, that there, there's, there's a trend towards job displacement and um, concentration of wealth towards capital and the owners of, and the owners of capital. I'm not, I'm not trying to be Marxist here, but it's a, it's a phenomenon. It's, it's not a new phenomenon. We've seen that in the 19th century. We've seen that in the early 20th century, and we're seeing it again now. And the key question is, how are we going to respond to societies? In the 20th century, only after two very, very uh, costly wars and a, and a huge recession, uh, um, institutions were changed. And there, was, uh, there, there were institutions that were balancing um, um, uh, across, uh, across people and across groups. Um, right now, it seems that we're moving in the, in the opposite direction. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a very real policy question. 
So I'm going to ask one last question, noting that Michelle should probably get ready for harvesting questions on the floor as well. To move from that very broad question to a very specific one, if we take a cell phone, which better not go off at this moment, and we look to AI, data, and let's call it multiplying the effectiveness of medicine. So some folks are working on a variety of very interesting cell phone applications using data that would take underserved populations, be they in southern Texas or in the developing world, and providing the kind of concierge medical advice that people get at MIT Medical, but don't necessarily get elsewhere. Meaning that the AI is being used in conjunction with measures, personal measures and records, to offer advice and check on whether people are adhering to treatment, but also gathering information which feeds back in. So that would be a beneficial use of the AI serving underutilized population, populations that are underserved. Uh -huh. On the other hand, those very same applications are also gathering data, which are potentially being sold to all kinds of folks doing research, good, or pharmaceutical companies that are seeking advertising, maybe not so good. And the issues of privacy and consent that we were talking about would bear on the beneficial and adverse uses of that information. Then you turn to governments and surveillance. And that very same data in the hands of governments could be used again for good or evil. It could be used for good. We look at the Wuhan situation now, and the Chinese government is using prescription orders and medical records to try to track people for purposes of containing the epidemic. Uh -huh. But it also could obviously be used for political control in ways that would be adverse. I choose this one example of a $175 cell phone and the associated information because even embodied in that one example is so much of what you were talking about. And my head spins because I don't even know how to answer the question with reference to that one example. And we're talking about a technology with implications that go far beyond. And the question, very simply put, is not so much to answer that question on the cell phone and the medical data, but how could MIT people engage more effectively with the very difficult values issues that are raised? How could we work to improve the terms of the trade-offs? How should we, or what duties do we as technologists have to address uh, these issues? What responsibilities and duties do we have? Well, I think, uh, well, th those are like Six questions. Yeah. Uh, it's unfair. Unfair. So, so, so I'll, I'll uh, let, let me let me start with uh, the phone and using the phone as a delivery um, technology for health uh, diagnostics and treatment. Well, first of all, it's a phenomenal opportunity, and um, uh, in many places around the world, including uh, my home country, Mexico, uh, this is extremely appealing, and you are already seeing successful cases of, um, say, detection of retinopathy, uh, the um, eye disease associated with the diabetes, that is being detected uh, with, through the cell phone, a picture taken uh, with the cell phone, and, and, and you see that already. And those patients are then uh, referred to the appropriate doctors. And that, that is creating um, a much better care opportunity for people. So that, that is there. But I think that going back to the US context, and this would, uh, would apply, when we talk about medicine, we should think of, uh, uh, the, in the same way that we think of any other technology or drugs, that these don't go unregulated. There's a reason why there are prescription drugs and there are over-the-counter drugs. Again, the algorithmic tools for delivery of medicine should also be regulated as such. And there are some things that a patient should not be deciding just because uh, the phone said it. And there's a very powerful uh, algorithm that everybody says works. And then, because of that, I'm going to uh, take this treatment. You need to go to the doctor. And that, that kind of algorithm, that kind of promises, should be regulated just as prescription drugs. Um, on, the, on the question of information, I think that we are uh, uh, going to see more and more uh, technology uh, enabling 
uh, privacy coexisting with this type of uh, delivery of systems. Uh, a lot of the opportunities, particularly using mobile phones, um, a, lo uh, uh, a, a lot of the distributed learning process um, will, will help to protect the data of, pa of, of patients or individuals you have on your phone. Uh, so, uh, uh, and again, if you are the FDA, you should own, uh, it, it might be a good guideline to only approve for uh, uh, public use those uh, technologies that have these privacy protection uh, uh, tools, like distributed learning and not centralized learning. The difference is that the, in distributed learning, the, uh, there's the, the, the training data from your phone will never go to a central server or a, or, 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 or a, a set of servers and can be exploited. It will remain on your phone and only uh, other things will go. So, so th there, is, there, there is this problem. I think that the larger question uh, is, not about, um, is not about technology. It's not even about companies. It's about government and democratic institutions. And that's where I think we, that we should be more concerned about. And because this technology uh, creates risks for A, eroding democracy by excessive surveillance and manipulation, and also el enabling dictatorship. And unfortunately, we are seeing that around the world, and we are seeing some of the technology that exports not just algorithms, but social control. Luis, thank you. We will turn to the floor for questions. And uh, Michelle, do you want to start over? Um, I'll, c I'll cover this side. Michelle will cover the other side. And if you could hold up your, your hands, and we'll try to get to you. All right. Could you stand up and identify yourself? And please identify yourself. Uh, my name is Bill Weinstein. I'm an MIT alum. Um, you talked about the need for the policymakers and the technologists to develop an understanding in, in order to develop policy well. And then you also pointed out that one would like to have a democratic consensus about how this moves. So now you've got everybody out there yep. who are not well versed in any of the technologies. And on top of that, they are burdened by a plethora of cognitive biases which completely distort their ability to understand the meaning of what's going on. How do you reckon with that? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that's, the, uh, I, I firmly believe in, in the democratic control of technology. I don't think that, 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 uh, uh, that uh, uh, we should live in a world where technology uh, goes rogue. Uh, but I don't believe in the opposite, which would be um, uh, technology control through referendum. Or um, that's because, uh, and, and you see an example, and I'm going to be a little critical of California here. Uh, if you see the, CC, the origin of the CCPA, this is a very complex piece of legislation that didn't go through the standard congressional process of hearings and drafting and consultation of constituencies. This is a guy, lots of merit, who drafted a, dra drafted a bill, gathered signatures, and suddenly the California Senate realized that uh, it was, it was going to pass probably with 85% of the vote according to, to the polls. So they immediately grabbed it and adopted it in a day. That's not necessarily what we should aim. So this is, I, I think, a fine distinction. I think the key question for policy making is how do you create democratic institutions for the appropriate policies to emerge? And this is not, the, I, I don't think that this should go unchecked. And that just because this is complex, um, uh, the people that don't know uh, linear algebra should be out of the conversation. I don't think that. Uh, but you cannot do it by referendum, particularly in the context of polarization and disinformation that we're living through in very much uh, fueled by this technology or enabled by this, this technology. This, 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 uh, I think this, this has to go through the, uh, uh, the workings of representative democracy that has delivered one of the most successful political models um, in history uh, uh, that is existing democracies, both uh, in North America and in Europe. OK. Um, next question. And again, we ask you to give your name, your social security number, <laughs> birth date, your first pet, and your high school mascot. Hi, I'm Anjali Sastry hey, Anjali. from the Sun School. So I was trying to link some of the themes in what you're talking about. 
it seems to me that your point about the differential impacts for big tech versus startups of a patchwork of policy is really important, and that policymaking needs to take into account the sort of knock-on effects of locking in too early or locking in at the wrong scale, right? So yep. you have a policy that's different from California and Oregon, or it's prematurely precluding or enabling certain choices. So what are the new policy tools that factor in, you know, these increasing returns to scale? The path dependence, using business models as well, looking at how this plays out vis-a-vis -vis business gaining power or changing its role in society, given different policy options. So the traditional policy methods might benefit from simulation, modeling, kind of what if. Here's what happens if we do this quickly, here's what happens if we wait and see, here's what happens if we do this temporarily. It seems like there's like a meta, another layer of complexity on thinking of policy formulation. I did a, a little study a few years ago with an MIT student where we modeled malaria policy, and the naive solution, which is to invest in both prevention and treatment, was the worst policy, right? It was better to go all in one or the other rather than some kind of middle ground. And it made me realize how complex policy making is when you look in this way. That's a great question, Angelio. Thank you for being here. Um, um, the, well, I, I certainly don't think that fragmentation is, is a good idea. But I also mentioned in the presentation that I strongly believe in temporal um, experimentation and, and, and temporal regulation as a, as, as a way to learn. Uh, I mentioned the state of Vermont. I mentioned the state of New York. Uh, uh, we, we had at the uh, last semester, we, we had one of the um, uh, members of the legislation in New York that drafted. They're going through a study process. So I think that, first of all, there's got to be awareness in, in, this, in, in, in uh, um, legislators and policymakers. And there's got to be an understanding of what it is. And uh, the, to, to me, the greatest concern is jumping too early. And locking in, establishing path dependence, as you very well described, much better than I can. Uh, but I, I think that's that's the reason why tools like having preemption. So uh, there's, I, I understand why people are very concerned about face recognition, particularly in the use by police and and, and government. But I don't think that it's the, it's 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 it's, it's probably the, the the optimal solution to ban it forever and to impose. Uh, a, but, but perhaps a moratorium or a, uh, it's, it's, much, it's much better uh, until we understand better and that technology evolves and is mature enough. And you go through an F FDA type of process uh, through that. Um, regulatory sandboxes, pros and cons. There's, there's, um, I, I, in Mexico, I led the FinTech uh, uh, law. And we, we, we went through the process of calibrating what a regulatory sandbox is. It's not easy, but it allows you to learn. There's a lot of learning to be here before committing too hard uh, uh, towards, towards something. I think the worst case scenario is where you commit too early and have fragmented commitments. And unfortunately, that is not a scenario that can be discarded right now. Hi, my name is Daniela. I'm a freshman here, part of CSAIL. Thank you so much for your talk. My question is, when it comes to mitigating bias and um, manipulation through AI, do you think that there is systematic institutional issues that we need to solve in government, such as inequality or corruption from corporations, first, before we can entrust these governments with creating responsible regulation for AI? Well, thank you. Uh, 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 thank you for being here, and thank you for your question. That, those are, the, you mentioned two, two uh, topics that are quite important, but. Um, Analytically, they're not exactly the same, manipulation and, and bias. Um, uh, and uh, both are really, really bad and things that we should be concerned about. And uh, any country uh, should have policies about, about those. I, I think that, that uh, the problem of, of bias in algorithms has been a little bit of a discovery. And it was not obvious in the beginning that that was going to be the case. Probably if, if uh, um, econometricians had been consulted about the problems in dealing with the data sets and bias introduced by the data sets, that problem would have been identified earlier. Uh, it's the same problem that you deal with um, um, identification in econometrics 
a lot of that looks looks uh, looks the same. But I, I think that um, uh, uh, the discipline was not prepared uh, uh, for that, and suddenly you find some truly horror stories uh, on on that. I think that the understanding of the problem is much better now, uh, and uh, there's no one single fix for this. There's no magic bullet. I think that having more diverse teams, both in the policy making and in the uh, algorithm design and training helps, actually helps. And this is not just soft policy because it, it raises awareness, but that is not enough. And, and uh, I think that uh, the quality of data and the representatives of the data uh, is, a, is, is, is the key. I think that relying on fixes on constraint optimization uh, it's always going to be problematic because you lose accuracy, you lose power. So the true fix is actually on, on the data. And the true tension, therefore, the, two, the, the, the true, the, the true trade-off is with privacy. Uh, so, so there's the trade-off between privacy and, and, and bias is, is, is real. And I think that's something that we don't talk, that we, we don't talk enough. Is that intentional? Uh, are, are there uh, are companies or governments that are intentionally creating bias? Maybe, but I don't think that's the, that's, the general, that's the general rule. Manipulation is a very different thing. I think that manipulation almost by definition is intentional. And a lot of people have discovered that these tools allow for uh, a, a computer system to know a person even better than the person herself. And that, that, uh, uh, that is a problem. Because um, when you, uh, uh, you can spread very targeted information and, and, and uh, abuse cognitive biases. Then you have an opportunity to truly manipulate markets and the political, the political system. To me, that's, 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 the, that's the key. And I think that um, uh, in order to be constructive and not just uh, uh, being gloomy here, I think that technologies have an opportunity in developing tools towards empowering the individual in detecting Manipulation in, uh, in ma manipulative uh, intent, and making uh, raising awareness when a technology is trying to exploit uh, a particular uh, reason for for uh, uh, cognitive bias, and uh, we don't see that enough. There are some examples, some from MIT, uh, both at CSAIL, the Media Lab, uh, but we, we we need a lot more uh, uh, a lot more of, of that. And at the end of the day, we need democratic control of government, which is the very essence of democracy. Try to work my way across here, and also, you know, give the the make and model of your first car. Okay. Hi, I'm Shivani. Do you think Facebook should be broken up? I I, I don't. Yes or no. I don't. I don't, uh, I, I don't know when anybody who poses a yes or no, I think, is lying. Uh, the, 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 it's, it's not clear because there there is not enough uh, there is not enough uh, um, um, uh, historical experience or evidence about um, whether just breaking up a platform, would that be the solution? Because maybe you have, you break up the platform and the behavior remains the same. We don't know that. Uh, the problem here, it might, the, the things that we see as, say, evil, might not be only attributable to economies of scale, which would be the argument for, for, for breakup. I think that, that uh, we, we need more uh, har harder thinking on that. By the way, Europe today established that, um, that they are going to impose regulation on requiring Facebook and Google and Amazon to share the data, just as banks do, and or or um, uh, other industries like like uh, the auto industry do. This is this just happened five hours ago, literally. So and and that's very different from breaking up the companies. Um, and this was uh, this was uh, um, um, uh, Commissioner Vestager was the antitrust person in Europe. So not necessarily a breakup is necessary. You need to look more carefully at the, the true economics of the platform and what is creating this imbalance of power and address that, not just. Uh, th this is not the standard oil necessarily. OK. Hi, uh, my name is Adam Nagy. I'm at the Berkman Klein Center and uh, one of the co-authors of the principles report that you mentioned. Congratulations, th and thank you. That's a great report. And I'm actually joined here by another co-author, uh, Nele, uh, is right here as well. Um, thank you to both of you. So 
my question is uh, somewhat self-servingly related, not to that report, but to, I noticed when you talked about the translators, the, the one of the groups that was missing was academics. Um, they weren't up there, and we're in an academic institution. Uh, you know, the report was created in an academic setting. And I'm curious how, in your experience as a policymaker, you interacted with academics and what academics can do to get reports like ours or like the MIT report that you cited in front of policymakers and, and what are kind of the, the challenges to that um, and, and maybe tying that into the AI space as well? Well, I, I didn't put academics there because I don't think that they, they, uh, uh, there's a lot of that interaction. I don't see a lot of interaction between policymakers uh, and academia uh, the way that other translators do. Uh, your report is an exception. And, uh, and hopefully it's a very impactful report. It's a, uh, it's, it's, it's recommended reading for everybody. Uh, but uh, I don't see uh, a, a lot of that. In my experience, I remember, I, I, because of my MIT background, for some tough questions, uh, when I was finance minister back in 2014, we were seriously thinking about banishing in Mexico uh, digital currencies, um, uh, cryptocurrencies in particular. We were talking about Bitcoin. And uh, I came to MIT. and, and uh, 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 as a result of that, we were convinced that we shouldn't, that that was not the appropriate course of action. But that, that was very, very ad hoc because I, 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 I had friends here and I, I came from a place like this. But I think that it's not the general, the, the, the general norm. I, 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 I think that I started saying that academia and policymakers are far, far away. Uh, you guys are quite an exception. I think that's, that's very real. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Alonso. I'm a senior studying mathematics. Uh, you talked about uh, trust. Uh, you talked about trust uh, in tech companies. You talked about trust between countries. Uh, I think um, it's also worthwhile to talk about trust uh, from uh, uh, you know, citizens towards their governments and then trust in the academic institutions uh, that we are charging with studying these questions of democracy and AI and ethics and AI. And you kind of sit in the middle of those two as a, you know, a finance minister and foreign minister of Mexico, as Enrique Peña Nieto's campaign coordinator, and then as you know, uh, um, your role in uh, the state of Mexico, and then also now here at MIT. And so I just wanted to you know, address what I feel is like a little bit of a, an elephant in the room um, because uh, I mean, Mexico, uh, the political process in Mexico has always been, been marred by s serious issues. Uh, and Enrique Peña Nieto's presidency, Enrique Peña Nieto's campaign is no exception. Uh, whether we're talking about, um, you know, the scandals with OHL, whether we're talking about Odebrecht and Pemex and Emilio Lozoya, who was just last week arrested, uh, and your particular role in... Uh, in those scandals, we were talking about uh, the embezzlement of um, uh, money from the finance ministry towards the PRI's uh, gubernatorial campaigns, whether we're talking about Monex and the prepaid cards in Soriana. Um, so, you know, it, it, I just thought that it would be uh, worthwhile to address that in the context of, of your uh, discourse on trust and uh, democracy. Um, because I, yeah, I just thought it was a big sort of elephant in the room, uh, especially you know as a Mexican national. Uh, thank you. Well, I, I acknowledge and I, I respect your, your your opinions and your concerns. I said it. This is this is not a talk uh, about Mexico. I'm very happy to talk to you anytime you want. My office is my door is always open and we can and we can discuss. I can tell you that I I stand by my track record and my actions. I I, I obviously as a policymaker I. I, I did good things, I made mistakes, but I, and I learned a lot, but I stand by my actions and I'm very happy to talk to you anytime you want to. My, my door is open and we can, we can talk about Mexico and any other thing that you want to. Okay, I'm going to recommend that we harvest a few questions, short questions. We can turn to you for an answer because we're running close to the end of the time. Thank you. Um, so I just have a quick question related to our report from the Brickman Klein Center. Um, so what we did was identifying AI principles that already exist, but what we also found was that there were very little principles. For example, we couldn't find one single document from the African context. Yes. Um, and so I'm wondering from your perspective, 
from Mexico, do you think that the existing principles are going to be relevant in this, these countries that haven't developed any principles so far? Um, or will they be different? And how do you see the development in Mexico or in Latin America more generally? And then how do you see the developments at the UN level that there are thoughts about developing global principles of AI? Do you think it's going to be similar principles that are already discussed? Or is it different if we include all these regions that haven't yet developed anything on this issue? Well, I think it's a big concern, the fact that, that, that um, uh, some regions have been mostly unaware and therefore disengaged from this, this conversation. I think that uh, uh, principles, most of them are uh, 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 general principles that apply everywhere. But there are some more, more um, uh, regional concerns or, or ad hoc concerns that should be, uh, should, should be addressed. Uh, on, I'm, I'm not sure how um, impactful these documents, particularly from developing countries, are going to be in actual policies. I think that's a big question. I, I, I haven't seen uh, much of that, say, in Latin America. Uh, we, we, maybe the exception is Chile, where we do see a little bit of a buildup of a policy. But other than that, I, I think these documents are scattered and not very, not very impactful. And I think that's, that's a, I, I also noted that in your report, uh, the lack of an African document. Not, n I mean, not, not, you couldn't find one African document. And, that's, and that's, a, that's a real concern, particularly as African countries and African governments are embracing this technology. Uh, some of it comes from China and are using it in different ways, good and bad. So I think that's a concern. OK. Why don't we gather one question, two questions, three questions, and then you can answer all or as little as you wish, Luis. Uh, over there. OK, I guess that's me. Uh, I'm Tim Rideout. I'm a Cambridge resident. Um, my mom's an MIT PhD, so I, I learned from how to think from this world. And that actually relates to my it's question. Genetic. It's genetic. I know, right? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not good at the math, but I, I think in terms of a sort of mathematical way of thinking about political science. But actually, that's my, sort of my question. Um, when it comes to, to bias and then when AI is used in real time, just the way it changes language, even inadvertently, and, and measuring political philosophy. So just quick backstory, you know, my mom was in the 70s and 80s. They were talking about, you, at the old mainframe, she would carry her punch cards over to the mainframes here at MIT and, um, you know, run her regressions and whatnot. And, the, you know, the way they, they, they did it was, you know, they, they tried to measure political philosophy on degrees from liberal to conservative. And that was just sort of the framework they went with. And then um, that got compiled over years. And you know, I've read the books. I read Anthony Downs' Theory of Democracy. He drew a little bell curve. And I was carrying these things around in my brain for years in Washington. And it took me a long time to realize that it's empirically wrong. And, and I've been conditioned to think this way because that's what I've read. And at least in the American polity, we've got progressives, liberals, conservatives, libertarians. And these, these are different humans with different political philosophies. I guess the point is, first of all, please, AI should not be used to measure political philosophy. But also, how do we, as this is used in real time, and to condition people to think, and you think of psychographic profiling that, you know, the obvious case is what the Russians did to our country. How do we, and it's an open question, I don't know the answer, but how do we prevent people to enable free thought and free expression and, you know, intellectual freedom so we're not sort of conditioned to think in very narrow worldview? Okay, and we'll get a couple other quick questions in here. Hi, uh, my name is John, I'm a grad student here. Uh, my question is about the geopolitics politics of AI, uh, which you uh, addressed a little bit. Um, here in the United States, we've seen that Google has refused to work with the DOD on their projects due to ethical concerns. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, there are other countries where there's a much closer uh, military and uh, research connection. Uh, do you see that as a risk to a global uh, security order? And how should the United States address that? Okay, and, we get, okay, and that, that'll be the last question of the day, an easy one. And, uh, an easy one, yeah. yeah and then like. afterwards, if people are interested, please come up front. Yeah, Go ahead. Uh, on, on the political geometry, just a couple of weeks ago, we were, uh, Ken and I were working, uh, uh, working with this group of senior um, military officials, US officials, and there was a talk on Russia uh, by a, a, a fantastic scholar from Harvard, Alex, uh, uh, I don't remember his last name, you can, you, you can remember. It's all Chatham House rule. 
yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. An anonymous senior scholar yeah. from Harvard. But, but an anonymous se senior scholar, yeah. But the, the point is, they didn't, apparently they didn't target a particular ideology or a particular label, liberals, progressives. They just target everybody and, and try to infuse extremes. I think that the, the, uh, the richness of democracy is in diversity of ideas. I think the problem is polarization and going to the extreme and the lack of ability to communicate with others. And that's a problem that these platforms can, can, can create, but it doesn't have to be this way. It's the way uh, we've, we've, we've been using um, technology. So, so uh, I, don't, I, I don't think this is a liberal problem or a, a conservative problem. No, this is, this is a, a fueling polarization to maximize engagement and profits. That's, that's a different problem, or th for geopolitical purposes, as with the Russian um, uh, 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 case. As, as with the military, uh, uh, just, just one, uh, one note, that case uh, uh, about Google is a, has been singled out, but it was once one episode. And Google continues to have a lot of contracts with the DOD and other military-related agencies. So uh, that obviously created a lot of news, but it didn't change the, uh, uh, a lot of the relationship. I think it did help uh, uh, to put some restraint in the kind of things that were done. It raised the awareness of the, of the problem, but uh, I, I think it would be completely inaccurate to describe uh, US industry, including the tech platforms, as disengaged with the US military. That is not happening. Okay. And all that remains is for us to express our thanks to Luis Figueroa for his talk. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.